The Fermi Paradox, Part 26, Into the Light. This video is part of a collaboration I'm doing with Alberto of Exoplanets Channel and Isaac Arthur on a topic of interest to all of us, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This collab will focus collectively on alternative modes of communication with aliens to radio, particularly optical lasers. Please follow the links to the other videos in this series, as they do help put this video into context. And of course, even though I consistently forget to say this for myself, don't forget to like and subscribe. And thank you again, Alberto and Isaac, for giving me this chance to explore this topic together with you. In 1959, two scientists, Giuseppe Caccioni of CERN and Philip Morrison of Imperial College London, published a paper in the journal Nature. Titled Searching for Interstellar Communications, the paper would effectively become the catechism for the emerging discipline called the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or SETI. The paper declared a number of axioms that would become venerated truths within the SETI community. First, that any extrasolar civilization would not only be contactable, but that they would, in the words of the authors, quote, look forward patiently to answering signals from the sun, which would make known to them that a new society had entered into the community of intelligence. In short, they would contact us. A somewhat cocky assumption, perhaps, but it made the job easier for us. Right, Isaac? Uh, that was the idea, anyway. Our task was to listen. Needless to say, given the vast distances involved, the only feasible mode of contact was by electromagnetic radiation. That array of frequencies that encompass not only the light we see, but the heat we feel, and the radio waves we still infrequently listen to. Obviously they would tailor their signal to ensure we could receive it, and so restrict themselves to the window of frequencies to which our atmosphere was transparent, above the radio shadow of the galaxy itself, yet not so high as to be swamped by quantum noise. This of course assumes they haven't got some better method than electromagnetic waves to use, and we explore that notion in part 1 over on my channel but we don't know of any such better methods and they might assume we did not and try to contact us using radio even if they had better options. However, the electromagnetic spectrum is huge and if you want your signal noticed, it helps to put it somewhere or folks would tend to look first. Thanks Isaac. To that end, these first SETI pioneers chose the 21 centimeter frequency of hydrogen as the best to search for, both because it met all the above criteria and also because it would be easily discovered by any nascent radio astronomers. The commonest substance in the universe would act as the galactic unifier, the totem for the tribe of sapiens. But that same year, a startling invention would offer a counter to that narrative. Drawing on earlier work by physicist Charles Townes, Gordon Gould would compose the first scientific paper on a new phenomenon. If an electron orbiting an atom were hit by a photon whilst already excited to a higher energy level, a process called stimulated emission, it produced two photons in precise phase and frequency with one another. If one pumped energy into a large number of said atoms, and then bounced the resulting photons back and forth with precise mirrors, you could amplify the beam to create a single, narrow ray of coherent light. Towns had already constructed the first attempt at such a device though one which employed microwaves rather than shorter visible light. He called the process Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation, or MASER. Gould called his still hypothetical visible light variant a laser. The first functional laser was constructed just one year later by physicist Ted Maiman of Hughes Research Laboratories in California, using a synthetic ruby. This laser was barely powerful enough to entertain a cat, but in 1961, Charles Townes published a paper in Nature, in which he speculated on the possibility of lasers, or as he called them, optical masers, as a means of interstellar communication, suggesting that they may have the advantage of being focused not merely on a star, but on a specific location, such as its habitable zone. But in the short term at least, the impracticalities of so-called optical SETI proved too burdensome. 
1971, as part of a joint program with the American Society for Engineering Education, NASA commissioned Project Cyclops, a grand vision for an Apollo-style program to enable contact with alien intelligence. The project is most famous for its proposed end goal, a vast array of 1,030-meter radio dishes set into a giant eye 10 miles, or 16 kilometers, across, estimated to cost about $60 billion in modern terms. It saw this as the best option to detect accidental radio leakage out to 100 light-years, or a directed message out to 1,000 light-years. As Isaac noted in his video, the U.S. government's SETI project was shut down for costing about one ten millionth of global GDP. The Cyclops' eye would have cost a full thousand. But the project wasn't all pie-eyed sky dreams. It was also a thorough examination of the various proposed methods for ETI communication, including optical. Ultimately, the project discounted optical on the grounds that the only reason to employ lasers would be their ability to be focused into narrow beams. But these beams would require large receivers at our end to detect. Also, microwave range signals were more practical than visible light as they allowed a far greater range at the same power, could be detected using far cheaper and more durable materials, and perhaps most importantly, were detectable in all weather. And so, for nearly 30 years, SETI would focus its efforts on the radio and microwave end of the spectrum, while optical was left to a small cadre of enthusiasts. Towns himself conducted an optical survey in the 1990s using the Mount Wilson Observatory's 1.7-meter telescope. But by the late 1990s, perspectives were shifting. After 40 years of silence, the sacred allure of the so-called waterhole of the hydrogen to hydroxyl band was beginning to fade. It was ever more evident that whatever interest any benevolent intelligence had for our little blue planet, they had little interest in sharing it with us. As the number of radio channels under its purview grew into the millions, SETI began to ponder the possibilities of optical. Laser technology was advancing year on year at Moore's Law speeds, and our communications network had shifted from the over-the-air radio broadcasts of the 1950s to an enclosed network of laser-guiding fiber-optic cables. The capacity for electromagnetic signals to smear out over long distances led many in SETI to consider the benefits of laser's narrow bandwidth. As Isaac noted in his video, narrow beams are a more practical means of transmission than pan-directional broadcasts, and are more efficiently created in the optical than in radio. A narrow beam also limits leakage and prevents others from listening in. By 1998, SETI researchers like Paul Harowitz of Harvard and David Wilkinson at Princeton began to search the optical for extraterrestrial messages focusing on nanosecond-long pulses. The reason that optical SETI focused, and indeed still focuses, on nanosecond pulses rather than continuous beams is that for that brief period, it is possible for a laser transmitter to generate power of up to one petawatt, which is roughly the amount of heat carried by the Gulf Stream. This allowed a laser transmitter to briefly outshine its host star. Assuming that a telescope receives about a million photons per second from its target star, then during the 100 to 1000 picoseconds between an optical pulse, it would emit just 0.0005 photons, during which time the pulse would have emitted tens, hundreds, or even thousands of photons. Studies have shown that with just a 10 meter reflector and a mere 1 kilowatt hour's worth of energy, a 3 nanosecond optical pulse could be detected at a distance of 1,000 light-years, and could outshine a G-class sun-like star by as much as 10,000 times. Such lasers exist on Earth today, and so would be easily within the reach of any extraterrestrial civilization. The noise from the star can be reduced even further simply by employing more than one light detector, as the same false reading is unlikely to occur in both at once. The advantages of optical versus radio are numerous. For one thing, unlike radio, optical pulses are unlikely to occur naturally, and at nanosecond speed, the background had less time to compete with the signal. One thing anyone who has upgraded their internet to fiber knows is that lasers are far better at encoding information than radio signals, 
because the same beam can carry different information at different wavelengths. Optical SETI effectively allows ET civilizations to communicate in broadband, beaming up to a trillion bits per second. Far more information was initially conceived by SETI's founders. Also, as you can tell just by looking up at the night sky, natural optical sources are few and far between in the universe. And an optical signal could not be drowned out by the cosmic microwave background, pulsars, or for that matter, the detector itself. Laser transmitters would also be surprisingly efficient. A beam targeting our habitable zone at 10 pulses per second, assuming one captured photon per every 100 meters of dish, would require only 20 kilowatts of power to run. Of course, you wouldn't want it to be any narrower than that, or it would risk missing the receiver. You'd also need to compensate for stellar drift over the tens, hundreds, or thousands of years your message would take to arrive though presumably a beam could be deliberately widened to give the transmission a few astronomical units of leeway. Also, you would need a very high-resolution detector. A one nanosecond pulse would get lost in a detector only capable of reading ten nanoseconds at a time. While pulses are generally assumed to be in the range of nanoseconds, or billionths of a second, they have been speculated to run as quickly as picoseconds, trillionths of a second, or even tens of femtoseconds quadrillionths of a second. A picosecond-level transmission would reduce the noise across the entire sky to just 0.1 photons per pulse, which is negligible. However, we are unlikely to see pulses faster than this. A pulse faster than 29 femtoseconds for a near-infrared laser would crash into Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And pulse frequencies faster than a picosecond would also run afoul of dispersion and refraction in Earth's atmosphere. A detector capable of reading nanosecond pulses would be able to detect a single burst of leaked information whether or not it is ever repeated, such as a flash from an interstellar communications beacon momentarily turning in our direction. This would remove the necessity of aliens being impressed enough by our yokel planet to give it a ring. Though if we're expecting anything more than that momentary flash, the narrow bandwidth of lasers means ET better be dialing our number, or we're never going to see it. Nonetheless, as Alberto notes in his video, the number of optical surveys keeps growing. In 2006, Harvard, together with the Planetary Society, unveiled the first all-sky optical SETI telescope, the largest single telescope devoted to SETI in North America. To date, at least according to their website, it has completed five all-sky surveys comprising over 1,000 separate shots. In 2017, Nate Tellis of UC Berkeley and Jeffrey Marcy, discoverer of the first extrasolar planet around a sun-like star in 1995, conducted the largest single search for optical city signals ever undertaken. To avoid having to demand valuable telescope time from the real astronomers, the team undertook an archival search of 68,000 spectrographs taken by the Keck Observatory, along with hundreds of transit images from various ground-based planetary transit searches. The Keck archives covered a sample of 5,600 of all but the brightest stars observed from 2004 to 2016, ranging in age from freshly born, just 200 million years, to venerable, over 10 billion years. The spectrograph was able to cover a region of tens of AU from the star, taking in its habitable zone as well as farther planets. Bar a quick look at Tabby's star, null result, the search focused on stars in our immediate neighborhood. Given that, as per usual with SETI, their result amounted to your standard giant donut hole, the team concluded that less than 0.1% of warm, Earth-like planets possess an intelligent civilization. Or, at the very least, one pointing lasers in our direction. I think when you're doing a SETI project, it's very important not to get discouraged by a null detection said Tellus. SETI has been in process for about 60 years, and it's been non-detection after non-detection after non-detection. And the search goes on. In July 2019, Breakthrough Listen, the massive SETI project founded by Russian billionaire Yuri Milner, began a second optical SETI search, supplementing their 36 nights per year at the Lick Observatory's automated Planet Finder optical telescope with a collaboration with the Very Energetic Radiation Imaging Telescope Array System, or VERITAS, a project designed to observe gamma rays from the ground. This is, 
technically impossible. If gamma rays could penetrate our atmosphere, we wouldn't be here. But it is possible to track them through the bursts of Cherenkov radiation produced when they do hit our atmosphere. Cherenkov radiation, in case you're wondering, is the light equivalent of a sonic boom, and occurs whenever light slows as it enters a denser medium and trips over itself. It also happens to be one of the most beautiful shades of blue in the universe. And now, for further updates, I turn you to Alberto from Exoplanet's channel. Thank you very much, Nick, for having me on your episode. In July 2019, the SETI Institute settled on the location for their Laser SETI project at the Robert Ferguson Observatory in Sonoma, California. Laser SETI is a pair of telescopes linked to a transmission rating that splits the incoming light like a prism into its component colors. Unlike previous optical SETI searches, Laser SETI have all the time in the world to find its query. In February 2020, a joint team from Caltech, Harvard and the University of California installed the first two of water plant to be hundreds in a project called Panoceti, or pulsed all the sky near infrared optical SETI. Each of the telescopes will be barely a meter and a half wide and be set in pairs a mile apart to ensure stereoscopic vision. Despite their size, they will each be able to scan a third of the night sky at a time. The telescopes will be arranged in a geodesic dome pattern and feature detectors first used in PET scanners. Jill Tarter, the first astronomer to dedicate her entire career to SETI, has said that the coming decade will see SETI hardness a thousand times the capabilities of previous years. If you want to know how could we try to contact extraterrestrials, I invite you to watch part 2 after this video. Gracias, Alberto. One thing I've always found fascinating about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is how it reveals our changing attitude about ourselves. The industrial barons of the 19th century imagined aliens building canals. In the 1950s, the originators of SETI saw them broadcasting radio messages across the universe to our giant rabbit ears. Today, we imagine them pulsing light-guided digital data in celestial cable packages. But, as Isaac said in his video, there's no reason to assume that any alien technology will conform to our preconceived notions. Perhaps someday our technology will reflect what the aliens are actually using, and we will finally log on to the great server of the galaxy. Once again, I am so happy for this opportunity to share this topic with other YouTubers, a chance I have seldom had in the past, and if you're not currently subscribed to their channels, I highly recommend it. Thanks again, and keep looking, fellow seekers.